Before I present a selection of my pictures, I would like to share with you um, something about the process I have developed all these years. One from um, all these, the processes I have developed while working from the birth of an idea to its desired end, which generally is a book followed by an exhibition. So where do my ideas come from? The triggers that inform my ideas are varied and numerous. Some ideas I fall into by chance, others are generated from memory of a place, a person, a thing, a time, or by space, or even an object, or a particular situation. My most recent project, which I have just completed, was inspired by one single village photography studio um, that led me to find 70 more in the country, but more about that later. I have learned the hard way that most ideas that, for me, just don't work. The few that do are the result of very hard work. I also learned that thoughts and ideas need to be explored before embarking on a project or after a project, but not during the actual act of photography. That act needs to be spontaneous and fluid. As I'm not a commercial photographer working in accordance with a brief, my work generates many surprises, and experience teaches you which surprise to go with. And so it is quite often that good pictures are somewhat intuitive. Today, I'm going to share with you the ideas that have helped me in my work. I will begin with examples from my earliest work and end with my most recent. First, what makes a good picture? You do need some key ingredients, and these, the basic ones are light, form, timing, and luck. The perfect picture, according to the great French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson, is a combination of all of these, as they happen in a fraction of a second. And these require the heart, the mind, and the eye to work in sync. He called it the decisive moment. On the process of photography, he said, it is seldom you make a great picture. You have to milk the cow a lot to get plenty of milk to make a little cheese. I milked a lot of cows to produce my first book, titled Bombay Mix, which was a compendium of street pictures taken over 20 years. Now, when I look back at my contact sheets, I can recognize in them my training ground as a photographer. There were some hits, but there were a lot of misses. From this work, I have chosen five images to show you for their recognition of a moment one of the first lessons I put to practice as I started as a photographer. Here we see the moment that a child performer is hurled into an unending sky. I feel we are more fearful for her than she seems to be for herself. Next, we catch a moment of three moods and gestures, the pens pensive, richly attired Falak, her furry-clad sister, who's jumped into the frame as she's seen me, and her bored, rather distracted grandmother. They're all going somewhere. We don't know where they're going and when they're going. But this was a moment that I was able to catch. The next is a more dense picture, a more crowded picture. It's of a street wedding in a Muslim neighborhood in Bombay, where there are singers who live in Kotis. And the groom has just come in, he's shrouded. He's being um, welcomed by a, a veiled member of the bride's family. And neither of them can see what I'm seeing through my camera, which is the various moods and gestures of the wedding party around them. Here, here are, you can see a woman smeared with ash on her face, and she looks as if she's in a trance. She seems unaware of the festive crowd around her, while the goddess Gauri behind her seems to protect her. And here we see a moment of a sleeping man. It's as if his fatigue has seeped into the basket of coals behind him, and he's in a dream, and we just don't know when he will wake up. 
So we all benefit from an inspirational teacher. My mentor was Raghubir Singh, the great Indian photographer, who passed away in 1999 when he was only 57. He helped me not just foster my visual and technical skills, but he taught me really importantly how easy it is to miss a good picture and how easy it is to make bad pictures. As Katia Bresson said on the process, because by the time you press your arm, the shutter wants more, and maybe the picture was in between. Raghubir also made me aware of my strengths and my weaknesses. I was better upfront and personal when taking photographs. I was more daunted in large crowds. It was a weakness he helped me overcome, and the only way I could overcome it was to go out every day into the crowd and take pictures. In those days, there was no internet, so he introduced me to the great masters through books. So I had all the hundred books of all the great masters of photography, from Eugene Arche to Gary Winogrand. And he also privileged me by introducing me to some great American photographers who were his friends, Lee Friedlander, William Getney, and Bill Christenberry, all of whose dark rooms I had the good fortune of seeing in person. I began to see what made them such pioneers, each a master with a unique vision. For Cartier Bresson, it was the decisive moment. For Gary Winogrand, it was the tilt. For Robert Frank, it was the poetry of America. And for Diane Arbus, the often controversial, sometimes grotesque, but always haunting portraits of marginalized people. I started my career using the fast and magical Leica M6 camera, ideally suited to street photography. Later, I graduated to the Mamiya M6, a medium format camera, which was slower and better suited to portraiture. I dwelt in this square format for the next two years to produce two more books, Twin Spotting and A Certain Grace. The story of Twin Spotting goes like this. After my marriage, I moved to London, where in 1995, at a Diwali party hosted by the Patel community, my husband is a Patel, I chanced upon a Patel community directory, an exhaustive record of every Patel settled in the UK, and there were more than there were Smiths, listing names, addresses, birth dates, and village origins in Gujarat, and so on. Browsing through the directory, I noticed many repeated birth dates, which was indicative of twins in families. And then reminded of the iconic um, Diane Arbus picture of twins, that was the idea that just sort of spurred me at that moment. I just thought, bizarre as this sounds, let me find all the twins of the Patels in the UK, and I even went to India later, and see if I can do a portrait of this community through their twins. So I found a hundred sets of twins from the age of 17 months to 70 years. <clears throat> and my search took me beyond London, all over the UK, and finally to 40 villages in the Charutar district of Gujarat, which was the Patel homeland. So I'll show you a few pictures from this. So this was the book. So here are Riddhi and Siddhi, age seven. Their parents migrated from East Africa. And they live in Norbury. They run a, a dry cleaning business. And here is Milan and Mayur, a TV salesman and a bank accountant, in the bedroom that they share in Anand, Gujarat. And then we have shopkeepers Ramesh and Suresh in Ramesh's house in Wembley. And I call them my Danny DeVito twins. And they were wonderful people, and they had a great story to tell me. So they came, uh, they migrated from Uganda. They were both postmasters in the UK before they became shopkeepers. And wanting to save every rupee that they had, every pound that they had, they didn't insure their first shop. Well, it caught fire and they lost everything. They had already lost everything in Uganda. But by the time I photographed them, they were now running three shops, they were prosperous, and they didn't look back at all. They just said, if you can work hard and have a sense of humor, you will always go ahead. 
So from, from the Patel journey, I learned that at the turn of the century, two consecutive monsoon failures in India prodded some young Patel farmers to seek their fortunes elsewhere in East Africa. Like the forefathers of Ramesh and Suresh, and here are Shilpa and Sheetal, the first set of twins I photographed in their father's gleaming first car. Um, so their forefathers, should we move to the next slide? And this is Love and Kush in Dharmaj, Gujarat. And I photographed them from outside their classroom, and I tried to use the window pane as a kind of divider to show them as twins, but also to show their difference as well as their sameness. So, um, so, so their ancestors, not theirs, but the ones in the UK, were, uh, their forefathers were dislocated by Idi Amin in Uganda. And homeless, they ended up predominantly as shopkeepers in England, thousands of miles from their country of origin. So my Patel twins then became a visual record of the sameness and difference of an enterprising migratory diaspora in two very different landscapes and settings in India and the UK. And I had, and I had Raghubir in my life, who took this work all over the world to find me my first publisher. And I don't think I would have had the guts to do it by myself, so I really thank him for that. It was also by accident that I encountered the Siddhi community, uh, driving through a village in the Gir forest on a family holiday. Curious how a community of African origin came to settle in Gujarat, I later discovered their roots date back to almost a thousand years, when they came in three waves, as traders, mercenaries, mariners, and slaves. In Gujarat, they found home and patronage from a local king, who was so impressed by their lion-tracking skills and their loyalty that he gave them two villages, Jambur and Sirwan, in the middle of the Gir forest. So if you go to the Gir forest, you will find two villages of Siddhis in, in the middle of the forest. Others dispersed to Hyderabad, Goa, and Karnataka, Unlike my earlier projects, where I had unfettered access, first as a Bombay native, and next because I was married to a Patel, access to the Siddhi was difficult, as the community tends to remain exclusive and not exactly welcoming of outsiders. I had to earn acceptance, and this took time, and it took going and meeting various members of the community without a camera. This task took a few months, and also it meant journeying to different parts of the country, some quite remote. My efforts to gain their trust were greatly abetted by Hirbai Ben, a dynamic elder who took me under her wings and helped pry many closed doors. My book is dedicated to her, and I'd be happy to show you some pictures. So this is Majid and Hussein. They were the first people I met and I did not photograph as I entered the village. They were playing carom. They had baseball caps, and they looked at me as if to say, just get out of here, you know. And um, I tried to say, well, I had come there to meet Hirbai Ben and all that. And they said, well, uh, you'll have to call her, you know. She has a phone, you know. And this, by the time I got to photograph them and they got to like me, it took, it took a couple of months. Uh, they were uncertain and suspicious of my motives. One of them asked me, are you photographing in black and white because we're black? Another wanted to know what exactly I was going to do with these photographs. And photogra photographing the Siddhi over the many years that I did, although enormously rewarding for me, made me privy to the enormous problems affecting this much-neglected community. A lot needs to be done, and I hope my pictures can reach the places to people who can actually be in a position to do something. Can you show the next few pictures? Next. 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 Yeah. Uh, yet I'm acutely aware that a photographer's mission <clears throat> cannot be that of an anthropologist or a social worker's. A photographer's work, to quote the photographer and writer Rod Rod Robert Adams, is 
to affirm life without lying about it, and then to behave in accord with our vision. Next. <clears throat> in conclusion, I wish to touch upon how shifts in technology can, can force a change in how one works. I was wedded to conventional photography, using film and chemistry, and working exclusively in black and white for over 20 years. Remarkably late, in 2015, I embraced color and digital photography, forced to do so by dwindling supply of conventional film and chemistry. Finally accepting the new, I set out to test my skills and start where I had once been 25 years ago, back on the street and back with the magical Leica, this time a digital one, the M9. And I walked the streets of a village called Manori, and I'm showing you some pictures. This was my entry into color. And it was here on the streets of Manori that I stumbled upon a rundown and neglected photo studio, where the germ of a new idea was then sown. So a year and a half later, I went on to find 70 more studios around the country, which gave birth to my newest work titled Still Lives. So this is in Jaipur. So I found these old studios that are all on the brink of closing down. This is Jaipur. This is Bhavnagar, Gujarat. And this was, if you can go back, this was a model of Gandhi that was 100 years old, because the studio was 100 years old. And the grandson who now runs Prince Studio said, in those days, children would come to sit by Gandhi and get themselves photographed. And so I thought it was a very interesting uh, prop, which is, of course, now not used that much. Next. This was in Trivandrum. A young Malayali boy had come in to be photographed for something, and I asked him if I could take a picture of him. And this is in my Manori studio, which was called Jagdish Photo Studio. And it was Eid, so it was a lucky day for me. So the children were all coming in, and the parents and all really beautifully dressed up. And so I had a very lucky day that day and got some good pictures. This is a village in Orissa. And this is also in Orissa, where the studio owner actually paints his backdrops. And now his trade is coming to an end because he doesn't have any business. So I would like to end with a quote by Robert Adams again on why people photograph. When, photogra when photographers get beyond copying the achievements of others or just repeating their own first accidental successes, they learn that they do not know where in the world they will find pictures. So if you had asked me while I was doing portraits of Patel twins in the UK, whether I would photograph a Gujarati-speaking African tribe that came centuries ago to India, or whether I would find 70 village photography studios at the brink of change, mirroring my own brink of change, I would never even have remotely guessed. Thank you.